Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you are listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast. Each week, we look at application development and management at scale. Our show this week is brought to you by Pivotal. Pivotal is on a mission to modernize IT. They bring together this portfolio of cloud and data products with agile engineering discipline. These include Cloud Foundry, Redis, RapidMQ, and Spring. You can find them at Pivotal.io. Now on to the show. Hey, it's Alex Williams of the New Stack for the New Stack Analyst Show, and I'm lucky to be here with our co-host, Benjamin Ball of the New Stack. Hey, Benjamin. Hey there. And we're really lucky to have two guests with us today. We have Bridget Cromhout of Pivotal. Hey, Bridget. Hey, Alex. How Glad to be back. Good. Yeah, good to have you back. And Mr. Matt Curry of Allstate. Hey, Matt. Hey, Alex. First time on. I'm excited about it. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you here. Bridget, I'd love to hear about the work you're doing at Pivotal and tell us a little bit about Pivotal in 2016, so to speak, and where you guys are and what you're doing. Well, Pivotal in 2016 is a pretty exciting place. Um, As you know from when we chatted before, I joined in August 2015, and I'm doing technical advocacy for Cloud Foundry. And what I really like about that is going out in the community and talking about the open source Cloud Foundry project, just because I think it flies under the radar sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, People don't necessarily realize that it is open source and it's something that they can dig into and check out. And then I also really enjoy going and doing field enablement. I just actually this morning came from a meeting with um, a potential customer who is at that place in their DevOps journey where they're trying to figure out do we want to put this kind of tooling in place to help our operations and, you know, infrastructure people and our developers have less of that classic clash um, Mm -hmm. and a little bit more smoother operation between them. And uh, it's nice to be able to go and talk to them about how, um, from my point of view of spending a lot of time in the DevOps world, I see that tools are not going to give you DevOps, but, if you have the right people and the right cultural practices in place, uh, you can use tools to help you and, you know, to enable you on that journey. So right. yeah. it's, it's kind of exciting talking to people who are just starting their journey out as well mm-hmm. as people like Matt Curry here who are pretty far down along that path. Yeah, as we like to call it when he came on the podcast I co-host, uh, Arrested DevOps, we like to call it a podcast, you know, to help you with maximum DevOps awesomeness. It's kind of nice talking to people along that whole spectrum. Awesome. I like that term, the classic clash. <laughs> well, you know, it's the, like Andrew Kleshaver likes to put it, the wall of confusion between dev and ops. Uh-huh. It works on my machine, then I toss the code over the wall, and now everything is sadness and a slow-burning tire fire, and we all hate each other. It's like we don't have to live like that anymore. No, we don't. Not at all. <laughs> so uh, i like to just get started, you know, and Matt, you know, Tell us a little bit about yourself, and here's the context I'd like to have for this conversation today. I'd really like to start in the present, where you are today, what you guys are doing to, you know, as far as continuous innovation goes and continuous delivery. What are some of the tools you're using? What are the platforms you're using? And what are some of those next big steps that you're trying to take? And from that, I think we can get, we can draw back into you know, all states path to this point where we are today. So perhaps you could just talk a little bit right now about where is all state right now? What tools are you using to to help build your, build out this application architecture that we hear so much about? So where we are today is we're about almost 12 months into the journey, I guess, of really stepping on the gas and being aggressive about um, adopting continuous integration, continuous delivery, um, and test-driven development as part of Allstate. Andy Zitney, who's our CTO, gave um, a talk at uh, CF Summit last year, which was in May, I believe. That was really at the beginning. We were starting to to learn things and dabble with, uh, what does this mean, and can we really accelerate delivery and proving out the model of 
how much faster, how much better quality will we really realize big benefits from this effort? I think our initial results were pretty exciting. We were pretty happy with that. And since then, we've been on this journey of looking at our existing stack and looking at our existing portfolio of applications that are customer-facing, agent-facing, employee-facing, and trying to decide where it makes sense to move into this newer model and how we can make that transition. And there's a lot of process that does not have to do with technology that can make that very hard or very difficult. Uh, there's legal process, there's financial implications, there's people process, like how are people managed, how are people hired? And a lot of that also will end up linking back to how the accounting works and how, you know, when you come from a project mindset in a, in a traditional corporation, trying to move to this model of products and that the product has a team and the team has a run rate and they just deliver incremental improvements as they make discoveries and learn things about the market is a little bit, can be a little bit tough to get through that traditional uh, process, planning process especially. And so that's kind of been a lot of the work we've been doing over the last 12 months. And I think we've learned a lot and we've made a lot of progress in that space. From a technology perspective, as you know, we're heavily invested in Cloud Foundry. We are um, pivotal customers and they've been helping us a lot with that journey. But everybody's different. And one thing that you learn quickly when you implement a platform like Cloud Foundry is all of a sudden you've made one portion of your delivery pipeline really, really fast. And you've um, given yourself the ability to start doing things like use continuous integration and uh, continuous delivery. But there are also existing teams and silos and processes that cause friction. And no matter what you do, it's impossible to get away from those. So you have to start figuring out how you're going to optimize those things. We've started down that path. We've made a big dent in the identity space. We have a big investment in some IBM tools around identity management. And we've been figuring out how we can make it so that when an application developer deploys a new Cloud Foundry app via this new method, that app can be integrated with an app that was developed before we had the platform and the user can seamlessly bounce between the two and not have to re-log in. So that was something that we really wanted to drive from a user experience perspective. And then again, we have a lot of the traditional hurdles um, that most companies will have, which is the firewall request process is not really built to facilitate agile and accelerated delivery, the database um, provisioning and approvals and governance process is not really built for that either. So we're starting to dig through those things and figure out how to optimize those things because we know that as we begin to scale this effort, even beyond where we've come thus far, being able to make those things more efficient, more streamlined, more automated is going to be critical to our success. Okay, so I have, I have a few questions, and so maybe I can roll them into, into one. First of all, I'm curious about your, uh, your existing stack right now. What does that stack look like? And what, is that, uh, you know, what does that portfolio of applications look like that your developers are using? So that's one part of the question. So where you are now, essentially. The, the second part of the question is, I'm curious about that, you know, that friction between the, the pipeline that is now moving very fast, right? And the other parts of the, uh, you know, the infrastructure that are not. And how you're, trying to, how you're trying to solve that problem. So perhaps we could start with like is talking about your existing infrastructure right now. Sure. So Allstate has an interesting organizational structure in that the technology organization is aligned pretty much directly to the business organization. So there are technology silos for each line of business. So if you think about it, we have a really large uh, roadside assistance business, the second largest in, in the United States next to AAA. We have um, obviously the products that you know us for, which is like auto, uh, home, and life. And we have an assortment of other products. And each of those products um, breaks down into technology silos that deliver uh, software for those business units or for those you know, customer and agent-facing um, capabilities. 
And so what ends up happening or what has happened as a result of that is pretty much each line of business <clears throat> has kind of their own stack. And those fall in the basic three fundamental categories. Uh, we have a pretty decent investment in WebSphere. So we have a pretty large J2EE stack. We have a .NET stack, which is um, kind of all over the board, but I think mostly focused on C Sharp. And then we have a really large investment in TIBCO as well. So that kind of tends to be uh, the three places that we have opportunities. And most of the new stuff that we've been developing as a part of uh, what we've been doing with Cloud Foundry has been um, spring focused up to this point. Although we do have a lot of people experimenting with different languages and we've been less restrictive than we have been in the past. And that's been a bit of a cultural shift for us is kind of let the developer decide what's best for the project rather than trying to pigeonhole them into making a technology decision because it has to be, you know, it has to be supportable, quote unquote, or, you know, whatever the reason is. Yeah, I find that really interesting that you are doing a lot of Spring now, which of course makes perfect sense. But um, for the applications that you have that are .NET right now, uh, now that Cloud Foundry does have .NET support, um, do you have some people who want to continue developing in .NET or even migrate some of those apps to the platform? Or do a lot of those people just want to write in Spring now? Or what's the, what's the driver there? It's really an interesting conversation. Uh, one of the things we've been having, talking about a lot is we spend a lot of time talking about technology, but technology really isn't the meat of the conversation that needs to occur. And it really becomes a mechanism for kind of opting out. Like, hey, I want to keep doing what I've been doing, so your platform doesn't support my technology, and that's a great way for me to just say, yeah, I don't need to participate. I'll just like go back to my cubicle and put my headphones on and, and do my <laughs> and tr operate in kind of this traditional uh, software development method that we've had at Allstate for a while. We've been talking about bringing .NET in and uh, from the Cloud Foundry side and integrating it more closely um, just to kind of take away that excuse so that we can drive <laughs> the conversation about how do you drive the culture and the collaboration and the agile workflow and how do you do stories and what are the implications to that to downstream dependencies and integrations like those are the conversations we really want to be having. Um, and when we get to those conversations and we start to prove those things out, that's when we tend to get a little bit more momentum. But at the same time, we don't necessarily love the idea of investing in the Microsoft stack. Um, mm -hmm. But we're trying to balance that, right? Because at the end of the day, what we really want is great customer experiences and quality software. And right. you can build customer experiences and quality software in .NET. Sure. Uh, and I uh, like your point about taking away the excuse where yeah. somebody might say, we don't need to move to agile software development practices because we're going to just be bimodal and we're in the sad mode. That's like, you're not going to allow that. <laughs> I like the sad mode. I've heard so <laughs> many other terms. I've heard mode one and what's the Gartner one? Ninjas and Samurais or something. Mm -hmm. I like sad mode is way better. But why it's would way. anyone want to, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> The house is on fire mode. <laughs> so I have a question kind of building off of where you were talking about really kind of what it means to adopt these tools and technologies. How do you see uh, Pivotal Cloud Boundary giving Allstate a competitive edge compared to maybe other comparatively sized and really aged businesses? So we're talking about a business that's 80 plus years old, I believe. And it just seems to me like there's a question there of how does adopting these technologies and adopting these processes at the, at the business level, how does it affect the competitive edge you have in serving customers? And I'm really interested in hearing more about that. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So we don't see Cloud Foundry, or at least I don't, I guess this is my opinion, I'll state that out I, outright. I don't really see Cloud Foundry itself as a competitive advantage. Cloud Foundry itself really allows us to get out of our own way and tap into the competitive advantage that we have of being an 80-year-old enterprise, having a lot of built-in experience in customers and agents and, and how that works and what the customer expects of us and how to make those experiences better. Our goal is to 
enable the business to adapt to changing customer needs and being able to react to those as quickly as humanly possible, as well as do things like, you know, if there's some kind of event or, you know, disaster where we need to scale up rapidly um, to handle increased claims or, you know, do new and interesting things with technology that we could never do before around mobilizing agents or mobilizing people to provide assistance to our customers, that we can do those things easily without having to worry about the fact that it might take us, you know, 90 days to deliver a server or even 30 days to deliver a server. That's way too late. We see, you know, Cloud Foundry, like I said, as an enabler for us to kind of get out of our own way and, and drive the creativity that's housed within Allstate and, and make that creativity more customer facing more so, quickly. So you, you mentioned that you really have three major stacks, really, so to speak, inside these silos, the WebSphere stack, the, the .NET stack, and the Tibco stack. And you're saying that, uh, that Cloud Foundry um, is, is helpful for helping move things out of the way, I guess, or like it helps you, you know, loosen kind of, you know, loosen the infrastructure, I guess, so to speak. I'm curious on how uh, Cloud Foundry, how you're fitting Cloud Foundry into your existing infrastructure and perhaps provide some color on those, you know, on how that impacts these three stacks that you're talking about, WebSphere, Net.net, .net, and Tipco. So one thing we've done with Cloud Foundry is we've really made it separate. So when we stood up Cloud Foundry, we stood it up with a dedicated team. We didn't try and use like our virtualization team, or we didn't try and use an existing Linux administration team that stand it up. Uh, we plucked individuals out of teams and created a new platform as a service team, and they were the team that was in charge of standing up that platform. And doing that, it allowed us to kind of challenge existing norms for what we do um, all around operating the platform, which is... Uh, we made different decisions around how to monitor it. We made different decisions around, you know, how to deliver it. We saw it as an opportunity to really drive doing automated everything. You know, if you talk to some of the folks from Pivotal, we were pretty vocal early on that we didn't really care that there was a GUI, that we wanted to be able to drive everything through APIs and pipelines and deliver the platform um, at basically the touch of a button or, you know, maybe even not that. Man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it's awfully hard to check those uh, GUI clicks into your revision control. <laughs> it is. Revision control is an amazing thing. We should be able to use it. The consequence of that is it sits very much kind of outside of the existing infrastructure. But as uh, we develop products, of course, the products have to integrate with applications and services that live in those stacks that you mentioned. And so... We've kind of been learning and reacting as we go, to be honest. Um, we've mobilized people in a way that they can respond quickly. Um, you know, we're doing the agile thing and we're, we have dev teams that are helping us with things like Cloud Foundry service brokers and um, integration points. And we're finding that we just identify points of friction and then address those points of friction as they come up. So that's really what was, drove the identity example I gave in the introduction was we basically had three projects that were going live at about the same time that all needed an identity solution. And I was like, okay, now we need an identity solution. We better, we better figure out how we're going to do this. And we have to map, we have to find the right balance between the choices we've made and the technical debt that we do, we've accrued and how we want it to operate in the new mode being highly available, highly scalable and self-service provisionable. And we put a lot of effort into trying to get that right. And I think we've done a pretty good job. And then the other thing that we has come up is because these new services that are going on Cloud Foundry are all delivered through continuous delivery pipelines, things like, well, we have unreliable test environments in the legacy stacks or maybe not legacy, but traditional stacks becomes a blocking problem. And so that's also helped drive and kick off other initiatives um, more on that side of the world to address that friction. So we now have um, the ability to spin up and down WebSphere environments uh, on demand 
so that we can address the needs of the developers who are developing against Cloud Foundry um, because they were having issues with some of their test environments and their continuous integration tests would like randomly break. We're really learning and reacting and learning and reacting and, and living into that idea and cycle of the, the feedback loop and trying not to worry about too much early because we could really kill ourselves with the stress of all the problems we have to go tackle. We're really just kind of tackling them as we see the need for them to be solved. Okay. I want to ask a question, then I'm going to let Ben take the floor for the next one, or Bridget, if you have a question. Um, and now, now I'm really curious here. So one thing you did say is that you're really not using the existing virtualization team. How did you learn to do that? That's what I want to know. It's like, you can't just know that overnight. I mean, because I, I, I've heard this, for example, from people who say, well, we're trying to do continuous delivery, but I tell you, the QA team is really getting in the way and we actually can't actually be successful because they have a whole different kind of set of processes and systems that they use and they deliver and the developers just trying to like iterate and just trying to keep on building these applications. How did you learn this? How did you know not to um, rely on your existing virtualization team? So I think there, there's a combination of a few things there. I think part of it was we just thought that was the right way to do it because we were worried it would never get done otherwise. Um, and so that was driven out of the need to just break out of the existing process, whether it's onboarding or whatever, so that we could actually deliver in a reasonable period of time. And then the other side of that is that we had some history around trying to do some internal cloud stuff prior to going down the Cloud Foundry route, where we had used, um, I guess, what used to be Dynamic Ops, or what is the Be Realized suite for VMware now, uh, to create a self-service portal for spinning up VMs. And we were in, able to enable developers and development teams to spin up VMs, but the challenge was they would spin up VMs, but those VMs had to live in all of our existing process. So they get a VM very fast, and then all the rest of the things that they have to do to actually do something useful with that VM uh, would fall in the existing process. And so we really found that at the end of the day, we didn't make much of an improvement other than having a cool little portal uh, that people could see what they spun up and spun, spun down. And so learning from that experience, I think we kind of decided that we really needed to break the model and pull some people out that could think differently and challenge the existing process and just go and deliver and not have to worry so much about breaking the rules. We were really intentional from day one about customer experience and what we were delivering to the developer and making sure that what we delivered to the developer was something that they would want to consume even if they didn't work at Allstate. And that's a cultural shift, I think, from where we've been traditionally. And I'm guessing there must have been a fair amount then. I mean, thinking of Andy Zitney, and I did get to meet him at a recent event. Um, and just even speaking with him briefly, it seems clear that there's a reasonable amount of leadership at Allstate who have decided this is what we're going to do. And I think you do need that sort of leadership to make a decision that says, yes, it's okay for us to set aside whatever our past practices have been and make these giant leaps forward. Is that something that there's a lot of then cultural work to do inside the organization to get everybody to catch up at a different rate? Uh, yeah, I think there is. What is that cultural work? What exactly is that cultural work? Because that's so, it's so funky for so many people. Like, what is, what does that mean? Sure. So the, I can't really underscore enough, like how important the leadership buy-in is. The leadership buy-in is hugely important because we have done things differently and we do get a lot of questions. Why doesn't this fit into what we traditionally know and understand? And um, being able to drive those conversations in a positive direction, it, a lot is linked to the fact that we have a good amount of air cover um, or a good amount of support from leadership to challenge the way we do things today, um, to look at using more open source technology than we traditionally have in the past and to challenge our existing assumptions. Uh, a lot of it is we've made decisions at points in time that were very legitimate and based on the information that was available at that time. Um, but that could have been 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And a lot in the technology landscape has changed from then to now, and it's time to reassess some of those decisions and 
marry them up with what's available to us today. Um, and so the leadership buy-in piece has been huge. On the culture question and what that work is, that's a little bit of a tough one to answer. Um, we were talking about culture this last week uh, as a part of um, some of the leaders getting together. And one of the things we said is, well, you kind of know it when you see it, which is a funny thing to say because a lot of people want to measure those things. And it can be a little bit hard to measure. But when you see it in action, you do stand back and say, okay, this is different. For us, it's empowered teams who are able to make decisions independent of, a, of anyone else. And it's collaboration between individuals. Um, so Allstate is traditionally a company that's very focused on low risk and process in order to guide what we're doing. Um, and in many cases, that's manual process or a ticketed process or you know, any other kind of uh, process you can manage coming out of a traditional IT organization over the last decade or two. The collaboration side has been a little bit of an undoing of that in the sense that really driving towards just have a conversation, get the right decision makers in a room and make a decision, and don't worry about escalations. We don't need to have 10,000 meetings. And moreover, we don't need to wait a week to have a meeting. We can actually just be sitting together doing the work and getting stuff done. And if a decision needs to be made, we can make that decision in real time. And so that's the cultural work but then that sounds simple enough. Then comes the question of, okay, that sounds great, but how do you do that at scale? And that's been something that we've been working on and defining on, okay, we have all these small autonomous teams now where we've traditionally operated uh, from a top-down decisioning perspective. How do we make sure that those teams are synchronized and all executing towards a shared goal, a shared vision? Um, either at the portfolio level or at the global technology level uh, to be sure that we're doing the right thing for the customer because at the end of the day, that's going to define whether we're successful or not. And that's been something uh, we've been working for a while to define. We spent a bit of time with some of the Cloud Foundry teams talking about how they communicate across their teams. Um, Spotify has a really great uh, video on their engineering blog that talks about their culture and how they're organized, which very much mirrors some of the information we got from Pivotal. So it seems as a lot of different organizations are trying to scale this up, scale the, the behaviors up, and scale the collaboration up, that they're running into uh, similar ideas or similar solutions for uh, the problems that they have. Um, but again, it's like, I think one of the challenges is a lot of people expect us to have a master plan and we kind of don't really have a master plan. We're learning and reacting and adjusting as we go um, because we're trying to do something that not really anybody has done. Like there's no business case for doing this at an 80 year old company yet. Um, not to the degree that it's been successful at scale. So we're paving new roads and we're figuring it out as we go and we're learning a lot about change management and people management and the management of culture. And we're taking those learnings and kind of feeding them into the next iteration of what we're going to do to make this better. Well, and those fast feedback loops that you're describing is how you can do that successfully, right? Because you're not going to send everything to the quarterly, you know, review board to find out whether or not it worked. You're going to learn from everything that happens as it happens and then keep going forward. Yeah. Um, sort of building off of, I know you said you don't have a master plan, but I'm sort of going to ask you anyway, uh, some questions that center around a future roadmap. And I think this builds off of what we were talking about with the traditional stacks and how Cloud Foundry uh, potentially could help you there with uh, .NET. Kind of what I'm interested in is, is there any other new technology stacks that you're looking at developing for Allstate? And this could be dependent on Cloud Foundry or it could be completely independent. Basically just looking at what's ahead, is there anything that you see as being important down the road? I think that Cloud Foundry fits well into the idea of dynamically provisionable infrastructure for us or dynamically being able to deploy apps in front of the customer quickly. We, I guess we view that as uh, a capability more than a technology choice. So Cloud Foundry happens to be the technology we've chosen 
at this point in time to fulfill that capability. If there's a compelling reason for that to change, then we would certainly be open to making that change. But we don't have anything on our radar at the moment that um, is pushing us in a different direction. We see it as an enabler for um, not just transforming the way that we deliver product, but also for being able to um, manage our availability better, do things like self-healing a little bit more intelligently, and not having to solve those problems on our own, and being able to rely on some great work that a bunch of people in the open source community have done to um, give us capabilities that we've talked about for a while and have been unable to really move the needle on. And then I was going to say, in addition, it provides us a, a nice abstraction layer so that as we talk about doing things like moving into public cloud or experimenting with that, we can now expose people to the same APIs that were, they were using for on-prem, uh, and they don't have to necessarily know the underlying detail of whether they're on-prem or off-prem, and it allows us a lot more flexibility, um, whether that's elastic scaling or just general trying to optimize data center power and space. Um, it really gives us a lot of options as to how we want to strategically manage the technology stack. Now let's take a quick break before we get back to the second half of the show. Our show this week is brought to you by Pivotal. Pivotal is on a mission to modernize IT. They have a portfolio of applications which include Cloud Foundry, Redis, RabbitMQ, and Spring. They're a steward of open source. You can find them at Pivotal.io. Now let's get back to the show. So um, I, I'm curious about your participation in, in open source communities, how you guys are treating that internally as something, you know, that, you know, it's new to a lot of people. Well, I just signed the Cloud Foundry CLA today and sent it in. So yay. Um, Excellent. So, now we can, your pull request will be accepted. <laughs> we have some, yeah, we have a couple pent up. Uh, pull requests that are ready to go. So yes, we are contributing to open source. We've contributed a little bit to the log search Bosch release, which is the Elastic, um, the Elk stack. Um, so we've been contributing a little bit here and there, and we have been dabbling in contributing to open source. And you know that's not necessarily something that's entirely new to Allstate, uh, to be honest. Uh, our quantitative uh, research and analytics team has been contributing to open source for the last few years, um, especially related to uh, analytical models and, and some of the stuff that's out in the Python community and in the R community. So we are trying to get more engaged in it, though. We think that um, we can contribute in a, in a more uh, active way and a more meaningful way, and that we can really use uh, open source as a platform to drive you know, our interests um, across, you know, different pieces of, of, the, uh, of the stack that we operate. I think that's kind of where I think, you know, I think you nailed it right there where, you know, you were saying that your R&D groups or, you know, these groups that are doing kind of cutting edge stuff or using open source because that's where they have to go, right? That's where, you know, that's where the activity is. But increasingly, the activity for just everyday applications is moving into the open source community. So I'm, I guess I'm curious when, you know, when, you know, you're trying to, uh, you know, be, be more active and be, you know, be, be more meaningful in these communities, that, that's a change internally. I mean, and, and it speaks to me and, you know, and I think both Matt, you and Bridget can speak to this. It speaks to me about this, almost like this new inside outside organization that we're starting to see emerge, right? It's like, you know, you got to hire people who um, know how to manage in, you know, inside engineering teams, but also know how, you know, these external communities work and how you balance the two, right? You know, that's, I think, tr increasingly true for other parts of the business as well, right? You, know, you have to be thinking about not just internally and how you're developing things, you have to think externally as well, about how you're participating because that, that, that very much affects the internal development. Well, yeah, and another thing that, you know, 
Matt in himself does is, and um, probably other people at Allstate as well, is not just contributing code to open source, but also when you're talking about open source and an open community, just publicly sharing about your journey, publicly sharing about your successes, about your challenges, um, you know, speaking at events, that sort of thing. Like, I think that that sometimes doesn't necessarily, it doesn't get you those little green squares on GitHub, so people don't pay as much attention to it, but it is really important for helping other organizations that would like to go on the journey that you're on and have no idea where to start, if they can see some of you showing your work, your work in progress, um, even before they start delving down into code, they can see how the organizational change actually works for you and how the you know tools can enable what you're trying to do. I think that that kind of sharing is huge, and you should get a lot of credit for that. Yeah, and one thing we've recognized as well is that just like many companies that are trying to compete Allstate needs to be able to compete for technical talent. One of the ways to do that is a lot of millennials who are coming out of school and you know that are new software developers want to contribute to the greater good, and they see open source as a as a mechanism for for that. Um, and so for us, you know, it's a, also a hiring and a pipeline play in that we want to be an appealing and fun place to work. I think we've always wanted to be an appealing and fun place to work. I think the cultural shift is maybe um, facing the hard fact that we haven't done as good of a job as we should have um, in you know, being transparent about what we're doing to make Allstate a fun and appealing place to work. Um, open source is a mechanism for that, and it also provides us a lot more opportunities to get out in front of um, developers or through speaking engagements or through podcasts like this one to talk about what we're doing and hopefully get people engaged to help us help join us and deliver value for our customers. So what flavor of Cloud Foundry are you guys using? Uh, We're we're using Pivotal Cloud Foundry right now. Okay, that's what I expected. Um, Yeah. But and how are and, and how are you participating in the upstream community? I guess you just signed a CLA today. Can you tell us about that process? Uh, yeah, I think we have a bug fix for UAA was the impetus for getting that fixed, um, and that was something that you know we've been working on some of this identity work, and uh, we had identified something. But we had been we've been wanting to become more active um, in the Cloud Foundry community for a while. You know, the Cloud Foundry community is pretty good at providing mechanisms to engage and provide feedback and, um, you know, kind of get a view of what the roadmap is. Like many open source communities, that's one of the beauty, the beauties of it uh, versus kind of your typical enterprise IT vendor where you say, I need feature X and it just goes into the black hole and your sales representative is like, oh yeah, next quarter or third quarter next year. Um, And you have no visibility into whether or not that's actually ever going to (laughs) happen. Exactly. You kind of assume it's not, right? I think part of being, um, you know, obviously open source means that, I mean, we had Andy Zitney speaking from Allstate speaking at, you know, Cloud Foundry Summit last year. Um, And we also had him at our internal sales kickoff in January, just like this past month. And we had a lot of our customers there. And the idea of like, we're not just talking amongst ourselves and then going to come back and sell you some sort of bill of goods. Like we're actually inviting you to our sales kickoff so that you can see what we're telling all of our sales reps as to what we're going to be doing this year. And it's like, I think that that is the kind of openness and attitude that you get when you're a company that is largely built on open source. And so that you right. you know that you're going to have a competitive competitive advantage if you're out there telling people what you're actually about as opposed to, you know, letting them hope or wish. It's like, no, just tell them the truth. I mean, if the truth is awesome, just tell them the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the key. If the truth is awesome, you know, (laughs) it's not always awesome. Well, and like you just said, you, you are working with UAA. This is the authentication stuff, probably because of the work you were doing to integrate your uh, legacy auth stuff. And you probably found, Hey, you found a bug. So that's an example of that particular thing wasn't awesome, but since you found the bug and you can fix it, like you can help us make it more awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. And it's awesome for us because we know when it will get fixed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we like the transparency on the open source side. um, Again, all States fairly new. Uh, It's something we've been doing for a while, but not something we've been doing at large scale. And like you said, like it's been largely linked to kind of research and stuff that's on, 
the bleeding edge. I think we're now trying to start to play more of an active role. Hopefully this year we'll be able to open source um, at least one project that started inside of Allstate, um, which would be a huge change in culture or a, a huge milestone for us where we actually are releasing out to the community something that we internally developed. So we'd love to do that this year. And obviously we also want to be more active in our participation um, within the Cloud Foundry community. We've done a lot of work around Bosch and we've um, contributed some stuff uh, by proxy through Pivotal um, into Bosch. So that's been great. And we've gotten a lot of cooperation with that. Um, so we've been really playing with open source on the fringes, but I think, you know, this will be the year where we kind of start to turn that corner and it becomes more part of our DNA. At least that's the hope. And when you open source those tools, you're going to send some wonderful conference proposals to all the various DevOps days and Velocity and OSCON. That'll be great. And that, that's kind of back to that if you're going to look at DevOps as being like, you know, all right, culture and automation and measurement and sharing. And then people are like, automation, great. Sell me six units of DevOps. I would like, uh, I would like to put them into production tomorrow. And you're like, let's, let's go back and talk about the, you need to actually have the culture and the sharing so that you can use these, you know, automation and measurement tools to uh, their best effect. <laughs> so I just have a quick question, then I'm going to let Ben ask a last question before we go. There's a certain process for, for contributing to Cloud Foundry that's different than other um, open source communities, isn't there? I mean, there's like, there is a gating process, isn't there, to some extent? Or can, I, know, I know anyone can contribute, right? But there is a, there is a structure that, you, that the Cloud Foundry you know, has built, so, so it allows, I think, some structure. But am I, am I wrong about that, Bridget? Am I, am I incorrect? Is it just like any other open source community out there? I mean, it's on GitHub. You can submit a pull request. We have a bot set up that will open a Pivotal, a pivotal Tracker issue to make sure that it gets tracked and put on the roadmap and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, the bot will also. But you guys you also have, not have these. Uh, you know, you guys have been setting up these. Um, the Cloud Foundry Foundation has been setting up these uh, dojos, for example. They also have a training process, mm -hmm. right? So you. Yeah, can there's all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, this that's kind of along the lines of if somebody wants to do a drive-by pull request and it looks good and it gets you know code reviewed and it goes in, as long as they sign a CLA, then. Sure, fine. If somebody wants to be a lot more involved, then yeah, the foundation has a lot of great ways to enable that. And that's really, that's not driven by Pivotal so much as the foundation. No, but I, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> but there's a, I mean, there's, there's yeah, a connection know, there between the couple. Yeah, I know, you, I know you just had Stormy on, or somebody just had. I thought yeah, it was you, you yeah, folks. So you'll have to get her on again and ask her more questions about that. She would know so, more than I would have. Yeah, so I guess, Matt, what's your, I mean, are you guys going to be, just going through signing the CLA and just going that route, or are you looking for more uh, for more support to contribute to the community? Right now, it's kind of all in planning. Uh, we know that we have stuff that we want to contribute through CLAs. Well, and I suspect some of it too is driven by what goes on inside your organization in terms of how your organization wants to handle contribution. Yeah, like I said, this is new. I, I came from PayPal um, before I was at Allstate, and you know, coming from a dot com. Um, there was like a process in place for if you had something you wanted to open source. It was, um, I don't know if I would go as far as to say it was easy, but it was well-defined enough to where you knew exactly what you needed to do. I think um, at Allstate, given that we've, like I said, kind of been playing on the fringes of open source, that process is really not defined. So we're actively defining it and partnering with our legal teams and our compliance teams and our risk and security teams to figure out what that needs to look like. And so um, the timeline in which all that's going to kind of fall into place and enable us to really start accelerating, uh, we're not sure yet. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, experience of coming from PayPal to Allstate because kind of my final question, which sort of brings us back to the beginning in a lot of ways. Basically, I'm just kind of curious what brought you to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. What was the what were kind of some of the decisions that you made that said, "Hey, this is the product that I want, or this is what I want to work with"? And is that something that came a decision from you? Or was it a team level decision? And was it influenced at all by PayPal or your experiences at PayPal? Or is this something kind of new that was specifically based on the demands of all states' needs? 
Sure. I joined in uh, middle of March of last year. And when I came on board, the decision to go with Cloud Foundry had already been made. I think it was a great decision myself, uh, but it was not the decision that I made, so I'm not going to take credit for it. I think based on you know my working with the team, understanding the history a little bit and understanding where they were at, it was driven out of the need to accelerate um, this velocity by which they could deploy applications. And they realized that there were multiple aspects to that. There was the dynamically provisionable infrastructure perspective, and then there was enabling continuous delivery, um, enabling test-driven development, and um, driving automation all the way through the application, uh, you know, the application life cycle. And so the pairing of Cloud Foundry with the Pivotal Labs consulting arrangements, I think, is really what ended up pushing them towards Cloud Foundry over a different solution. Um, that, and I know the platform engineering team like is in love with Bosch, so I guess Bosch won them over early, which is surprising as a person. That <laughs> Bosch is great. <laughs> it's great, yeah. It's great once you, get, um, once you get past the learning curve a little bit or once you start to understand it, which I will say for everyone who's listening, it's not hard, but it is, um, I don't know, you just got to bear through it and bear and grin through it. It's not particularly difficult. It's just a little bit uh, confusing at first, I think. Absolutely. I don't know. Would you agree, Bridget? Oh, I, I would definitely agree. I'm actually, a, I'm leaving um, on Wednesday to go spend two weeks with the uh, Cloud Apps team that run Pivotal Web Services, our hosted offering, and I'm going to pair with them and uh, actually work directly with Bosch for a couple of weeks just so I can get a better understanding of it. Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Pretty excited about that. I think you have to, you have to keep your hands on the stuff, you know? We're talking about the cultural changes that come with a lot of these decisions um, that lead to creating a DevOps organization and trying to implement a lot of the automated processes. So we have our third ebook that we're working on, um, ebook three on automation orchestration. We're covering a lot about automation right now and trying to fill out some of the, um, well, really a lot about orchestration, I should say. A lot of the automation is, is kind of building from the second book. One of the questions I kind of had early on is if, if it would be worthwhile to have an article addressing the need for cultural changes in the organization when you're looking to automate processes or, or really what has to happen at the business level. And I got, kind of got some mixed feedback. I have some people who say they really, they really like to read articles about that um, or about the need for it that a lot of people still don't realize that it's not something you could just implement on the dev team and it'd be okay. Um, but a lot of people who say that they don't care so much about reading cultural angles. And so I, I would guess I would say that the people who say they don't care about reading anything about culture and they just want to dig in, you know, they just want to dig into the, uh, the details of a tool are probably the people who need it the most. <laughs> so if you can, if you can kind of sneak it in there, yeah, um, great. And just, just from a completely pragmatic, practical point of view, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the, um, the pre-release edition of Effective DevOps from coming out from O'Reilly Media. Uh, I mean, I think it's, in, it's out in early release now. I'm not sure how many chapters are available, but I know that the, the full thing is going to be coming out very soon, but I know you can at least read the first several chapters um, from O'Reilly, um, from their web store. But uh, it's, it's being written by Jennifer Davis from Chef and Catherine Daniels from Etsy. And these are, of course, organizations that have a great name in this space. And one of the things that they point out is that, you know, it's not that everybody just wants to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Like, you actually want the tools that you're choosing to be used and to be used effectively. And if you have a bunch of really broken processes <laughs> and then you automate them and then you do the terrible thing you were doing before, but you do it faster and repeatably, like, that's not necessarily going to make anything better. So examining, you know, the way your teams are interoperating and how you can get them to interop or interoperate more effectively using better tooling is a lot more effective than just saying, here's some better tooling, and now you listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the traditional orchestration trap. Like you have a orchestration team that runs like, I don't know, HPOO or something, and they're getting requests from every silo to automate one little thing and they can't see the larger picture of that all of these things are interconnected to some larger request. And you just end up with a whole bunch of ad hoc 
automation that because nobody's talking to each other and you know that's kind right. of what you end up with and you're like wow i've done a whole bunch of non-strategic stuff and i'm not sure i've really moved the needle on anything and if you're in the weeds doing ad hoc automation then you're probably wasting resources that you don't need to spend if you were doing things with a little bit more of a strategic picture and that does actually require humans to talk to each other i know it's like we got into this because we wanted to do computers, but if the humans actually talk to each other, then they can do the computer stuff a lot more effectively. <laughs> yeah, th we're, um, we're, we're going to be doing a lot more coverage in this area. It's just critical for us. And we're, you know, we talk about, we analyze the technologies and, you know, and it's try to explain the best we can, but it's increasingly apparent that I was asking about, you know, this new inside outside organization, right? And, you know, who do you hire for be your vice president of engineering, right? You know, who does the vice president of engineering hire, right? You know, um, what are those people who want to be hired? What do they need to do, right? You know, what do they need to learn? Because there's so many different parts to this as well, because then it gets into like, well, then which, which uh, open source platform do you decide to, you know, to invest in? I think maybe it's useful for people to look at the story at one possible end and say, hey, you've probably been part of IT projects that have failed horribly. Yeah. Um, the ones that failed horribly trace back what happened. And you'll always find that there was this team that didn't want to work on this thing that this team was working on. Right. And this team that went off in their own direction and just kind of stampeded forward and, right. you know, automated a lot of things, but it wasn't the things the business needed. And so I do think that you, you have to think about the overall drivers of the business and you have to think a lot about the incentives. And if those incentives are at cross purposes, if people are being incented to close tickets as quickly as possible, and never keep those tickets open for too long, they're not going to make sure that the customers, you know, their internal customers who needed that new database or whatever got satisfied. They're just going to push them away because their incentives are set up to just push them away. It's like you have to, like Matt was saying, leadership has to be really involved in deciding this stuff. And they have to um, be thinking about, you know, really mindfully what they're incenting before embarking on any kind of large, expensive, because they're always going to cost money, um, large, expensive project. You have to think about those human factors. Because if there's somebody whose bonus depends on that large expensive project failing, they might not be your best ally in helping yeah. finish it. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you so much, Alex. It's always a pleasure coming and talking to the new stack. Great. And Matt, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful being on with you guys. And Ben Ball, thank you for joining today as a co-host for the show. Thanks. As it was great always, hearing from you all today. And Ben, it's always good to see you, so thank you too. All right, that's it for today for the Newstack Analyst. I want to thank everyone for listening to the show, and we'll be back again soon. Our show this week is brought to you by Pivotal. Pivotal considers themselves on a mission to modernize IT. They have a portfolio of cloud and data products that embody agile engineering disciplines. You can find them at Pivotal.io. Audio editing and sound design for the New Stack Analyst podcast is provided by Broken Hours. You can find them at brokenhours.com. Hope to see you again for the New Stack Analyst podcast. Bye bye.